Hi everyone, and welcome to NCAT's webinar on Farm Finances, Organizing and Understanding Your Numbers. My name is Rich Myers, and I'm an Outreach Officer for the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which is kind of a mouthful, so most people know us as NCAT. NCAT is a nationwide nonprofit organization with six regional headquarters across the country. We work on issues pertaining to sustainable agriculture, as well as sustainable energy and sustainable communities. Today's webinar is being presented both by NCAT and by the U.S. Department of Agriculture Risk Management Agency. We're grateful to the USDA RMA for its funding and support of this webinar. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCAT's ATRA webpage. ATRA, which is also known as the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, is funded through a cooperative agreement with the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service, and we're grateful for their support as well. ATRA offers a wide range of services to sustainable agriculture producers, including publications, toll-free helplines, and webinars. You can check it out for yourself after the webinar on the ATRA website, www.atra.ncat.org. Today's presenters are Hannah Lewis and Tammy Hinman. Hannah has worked in sustainable agriculture and food systems for more than 15 years as a farm worker, as a retail produce manager, an advocate, a researcher, and an educator. She currently serves as Midwest Director and Local Food Systems Specialist for NCAT, and she works on projects related to farm-to-school initiatives, beginning farmers, and business planning. She has a Master of Science degree in Agriculture and Sociology from the Iowa State University and serves on the board of Women, Food, and Agriculture Network. Tammy has worked in the sustainable agriculture field no pun intended, for more than 20 years as a farmer with Cooperative Extension Service and for various not-for-profit organizations. She's currently a horticulture specialist with NCAT and works on projects related to beginning farmers, business planning, farmers markets, and market gardening. She also runs a small diversified vegetable and flower farm in Bozeman, Montana. After Hannah and Tammy's presentations, they'll discuss some of the most frequently asked questions we've received concerning farm finances. So I think it's time to get started. So let me turn things over to Tammy. Thanks, Rich. I am Tammy Hinman, an agriculture specialist with NCAT and ATRA, the Sustainable Agriculture Information Service. I have started and managed various vegetable and flower operations over the past 10 years. My partner and I are in the very beginning stages of starting a market here in Montana called Nana Louie Farm. So many of the topics we're talking talking about here are true to my heart. The goal of this webinar is to help beginning farmers become comfortable in handling their finances. Running your own business requires a basic understanding of accounting. Hannah and I want to help farmers who have little accounting experience to understand basic accounting principles and the forms that go along with them. We also want to introduce easy record keeping techniques that will help farmers develop good record keeping habits from the outset. Today Hannah and I will tag team this presentation. Up on your screen is a list of the topics that we will cover today. I will be talking about the first two topics of clarifying goals and attaining them and the resources essential to starting a farm. <clears throat> Hannah will talk about organizing your data and how to use numbers and data to help you run a profitable farm. Here is a breakdown of the topics I will discuss today. I will talk, as I mentioned in the previous slide, I will talk about the importance of clarifying your goals and asking yourself, why do I want to farm? We will discuss your financial goals and how to use them to determine what and how much to produce. Finally, I will talk about assessing the resources that you have on hand and how to obtain them to meet your production goals. Are you planning to farm alone or do you have one or more farming partners? Before beginning your farming operation, it is important to ask yourself and your farm partners if you have any, the fundamental question, why do I or we want to farm? It is also important to compare the reasons with your farming partner. In my past life as a farmer, this is something I failed to do. My partner and I had fundamentally different reasons for farming. I wanted to farm for market and make a living off of it. He wanted to have a homestead. Ultimately, we ended up parting ways because of it. 
on your screen are some questions that you should think about before starting a farm. They can help be the building blocks of your short and long-term farm goals and your mission. Do you want to work with your family? Witted Bowers Farm on the left, really, that was one of their main, their main goals when they started a farm. They wanted to be have their family close by and um, that is one of the reasons they got into farming. Do you like working outside as you see Bill Dow from Ayrshire Farm on the right here doing? Or do you want to own your own business and just be your own boss? Did you grow up farming and you want to return to this life? Or do you see farming as a way to make money? Do you want to grow food for your community? Or do you just want to have a homestead to grow all of the food that your family eats? If you didn't get a chance to write all of these down, no worries. The questions on these slides are available for you to fill out at your leisure on a worksheet that we have on the Atra website accompanying this webinar. If you have farm partners, you can fill out the worksheet and compare answers. It is not essential that you all have the same reasons for farming and you might have multiple reasons listed here. As long as each partner is aware and you can figure out how each person's goals can be accomplished. In the last few slides, we talked more about the bigger picture goals and reasons that people may have for getting into farming. Household financial goals are important because, important because they help create a roadmap for where you want your farm to be financially in one year, two years, and further off in the future. On your screen, you see some common farm financial goals. It is very common for farms to simply want to break even in their first and second years of farming. Do you want to make enough money to eventually quit your off-farm job? Some farmers start, start out by working full-time on farm, but most wait a few to several years before quitting their off-farm job. The financial goals that seem harder to attain, such as setting aside retirement, and bringing children into the farming operation can be listed for further in the future, but it is still important that they are there in writing and that you visit them on a regular basis. Laura Frerichs of Loon Organics in Hutchinson, Minnesota attributes their farm excess to success to growing their farm slowly and taking on little to no debt when they started. While her and her husband, Adam Cullip, wanted to farm, they didn't have land. They were able to rent land from the owner of the farm where they had worked previously. The relatively low rental costs allowed them to save enough to eventually buy 40 acres, while also being able to market their products and establish their farm with relatively little risk. They invested only personal savings and farm income into their farm until they took out a farm service agency loan to buy their land. One or both worked off farm jobs until the net profit was enough to pay for both of them to work on the farm full time. On your right here, you see Shiloh Avery and Jason Rorick of Tumbling Shoals Farm, and they took a different approach when they started out by getting investors, mainly friends and family, to invest the amount they needed for startup expenses. Shiloh describes them as being risk averse. They managed risk, though, through planning extensively before they approached investors and went so far as to have a practice farm. In their fifth year of farming full time, they are now buying their investors out. The thing these two families have in common is that they are both excellent planners and record keepers, and they took time to gain a lot of experience farming. They had extensive planning documents and operating income projections, also often called cash flow projections for, with farmers, when they first started out. Hannah is going to talk about these, these um, financial statements later on. Their financial goals and records help provide them with a financial roadmap map for their farms. If you are trying to achieve any of the goals that I mentioned in the previous slide, it is important to work backwards from your goal. So for example, if you want to quit your off-farm job in five years, ask yourself how much do I need to make in order to support myself? It may be that one person always has an off-farm job. Consider your living expenses, your mortgage, health insurance, etc. when considering how much income the farm will need to pay you. From there you can work backwards to determine a five-year growth plan. You can determine the gross amount 
that your farm will need to make by dividing your necessary income by 20 to 25 percent or multiplying your desired net income by four. In the following slides, I will explain how to work backwards from your net income goal using each of the planning processes on your screen. Before we launch into the calculations, however, I need to explain a few terms that may not be familiar to you. Your gross income is a total revenue that your farm makes. Your net income is a total amount that is left over after your farm expenses have been paid. And mind you, we're talking mainly just about your operating expenses and not other major investments like your mortgage. A common calculation to determine the amount that your farm needs to gross in order to receive your net income goals is an income ratio of 20 to 25 percent. This will of course depend on your farm's expenses, debt, and revenue. It also varies with time as your farm equipment arsenal is built. So a common income goal for a farmer's salary is $30,000. This is not for an extravagant lifestyle, mind you, but enough for one person to live comfortably on. This will obviously be more for a couple or a family with children. If you are unsure of how much you will need for an income goal, track your living expenses for several months. This will help you extrapolate your, expen your annual expenses. <clears throat> In order to find the amount your farm needs to gross or the total revenue of the farm, divide your net income by 25% or 0.25 as you see here on your screen. <clears throat> Using the same net, net income of 30000 that that will give you a, a gross revenue goal of $120,000. Most farms will not make this amount of money in the first four years. In order to be realistic about the amount your farm will make, it might be helpful to break this down into a five-year growth strategy, such as the one seen on your screen. This is a hypothetical breakdown of the annual gross revenue goals for this farm that has a net income goal of $30,000 in five years. After these numbers are determined, you can determine how your farm will generate this revenue. And I'll talk about that in, in just a little bit. As Terrell Spencer, NCAT's poultry specialist and a free range poultry farmer in his third year of farming says, for our farm, I'll be lucky to break even this year, so I'm working for free, but hopefully all of my infrastructure costs will be paid this year. Next year, that'll be $10,000 that I won't have to spend that might end up back in my pocket. That would be true of just about any business. If I can break even, but get to live the way I want and build what I want, I can do that for a couple of years to get where I need to go, where I can pay myself a real salary. I just see it as sowing the seeds of profitability. So how many acres will it take to support a farm revenue of $120,000? Production values vary widely for acre. It depends on the productivity of your land, your enterprise, market, etc. However, it is important to, have, to at least have a starting point for you to determine how much land you will need to support your income goals. An overall average per acre for a diversified market farm is $12,000, so let's use this as a hypothetical number. On your screen is a simple calculation. By simply dividing your gross revenue goal, listed here as $120,000, by the average gross revenue per acre of $12,000, as seen on your screen, we can determine that we will need 10 acres to meet your gross revenue goal and thus an income goal of $30,000. This of course may vary with livestock enterprises, instant, intensive production enterprises and such, but this at least gives you a guideline. To find income per acre goals on different enterprises, contact ATRA and one of our agriculture specialists will help you. So how are you going to make $120,000? So you know how much acreage you will need. Now it is important to ask yourself which markets will generate the revenue you need to make your income goals. Typically direct markets will yield more revenue, 
but they take more time to market and the revenue is not always guaranteed. For example, in, in farmers markets, if you have a rainy day, you might not get any revenue that, or very little revenue that day. When determining a market to pursue, it is important to consider your personality, your proximity to markets, and the scale that you are growing at. For example, if you have plenty of land and live 100 miles from any lucrative direct markets, it might work better to find wholesale markets that you can go to just once a week. Marketing assessments are a great way to determine how much revenue your farm will generate and which markets to pursue before you know the numbers. ATRA has several marketing tip, tip sheets in the works, so look for them on the marketing section of the ATRA website in the near future. Shiloh Avery and Jason Rorick of Tumbling Shoals Farm went to area farmers markets and restaurants a year before they were planning on farming. They observed which markets were really busy and which were saturated, and gaps that existed within each market. They saw that early and late produce was a gap, and certain markets were just starting to get busy. They also talked with some farmers that were willing to reveal the amount that they were making per market, and the market managers to see if they knew it in total. This helped them estimate their revenue potential with the markets and determine how much to produce, what to produce, and what numbers to put into their cash flow projection. Here you see Jason at one of the area mar farmers markets that they go to roasting peppers. They saw pepper roasting as a gap and use this portable pepper roaster as a way to diversify their products at the farmers markets. Many people have a bucolic vision of farming. They might picture being out in their fields on a beautiful sunny fall day bringing in the harvest. What they often do not see is harvesting in the rain, hours bent over weeding, being up at 4 a.m. to harvest or tend animals. Before diving in, it will be helpful to do an assessment of where you and your farm partners are at in terms of skill, personal preferences, and resources that each of you bring to your operation. A way to start assessing your resources is to ask yourself these questions. What are your personal resources in terms of financial resources, the land, and the experience that you bring to the operation? Do you have production experience? Is your personality suited for farming? Do you own property? If so, is it suitable for farming? What types of markets are available to sell your product? What type of information resources do you have in the area? Do you have a lot of farmers that you can ask questions and do you have not-for-profits that provide information and farm tours? The Skills and Resources Assessment Check Sheet on this topic goes into more details about this. It is available on the web ATRA website accompanying this webinar. The table on your screen is from ATRA's publication, Market Gardening, a Startup Guide, and it is available on the ATRA website. It shows the general equipment and greenhouse requirements for different sizes of market gardens. If you are starting out on a smaller scale, contract work can be a good way to go to avoid an expensive upfront purchase of equipment. My partner and I rent a lot of our equipment and contract out for our primary tillage in the spring. We are waiting for our farm to generate enough net profit to buy a few key pieces of equipment such as a walk-behind tractor and a tractor with a loader. Not surprisingly, the smaller acreages require much less equipment. As the scale of the farm grows, so does the equipment needs. Once you have determined what resources you need to follow up on, make a list of what you need to do to acquire the resources that are lacking. For example, are you lacking in experience? Farm tours, apprenticeships, and farming conferences are all ways to learn more about farming and the systems that have worked for other farmers. The ATRA Apprenticeship and Internship Database can help you find a farmer in your area to intern with and get more experience. Area agriculture organizations often hold tours such as the one seen on your screen. Do you need infrastructure or land? This is often the limiting factor for many beginning farmers. 
These factors can be overcome, but it may set you back in your original income goals. There are creative ways to farm through leasing land or working through an incubator program. The farmers that I describe in previous slides had sizable savings, they sought mentors, and they did not purchase land initially. The ATRA publication, Finding Land to Farm, is a great resource on this topic, and it is also available on the ATRA website. The important thing is to come up with a plan to meet your first year, second year, and five year goals and determine what resources will be needed to meet those goals and how much revenue it will take to purchase or lease those vital resources. This concludes my section. To summarize, when starting out, it is important to write down your big picture and your short and long term financial goals. From your financial goals, you can determine the amount of revenue and land your farm will need to meet them. Finally, through making a thorough assessment of your resources, you can develop a plan to set you on your path to acquiring those resources. All of this stuff is easier said than done. The key is writing it down, assuring that you and your farm partners are on the same page, and setting a plan in motion to meet your goals. And with that, I will hand it over to Hannah, who will talk about basic financial statements and record keeping techniques that will help you achieve farm success. Thanks, Tammy. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about the financial statements that farmers and any other business use to find out and to present to others, like a banker, how the farm business is doing financially. I will explain what each of these is, and I'm going to talk about cash flow from operations, income statement, and balance sheet, what each of them can tell you, and how to create them. I'm going to talk about record keeping, which is how you collect the data to create these financial statements. Finally, I want to emphasize Tammy's point earlier that the goal of this webinar is to present basic accounting concepts and to encourage listeners to develop good record keeping good record keeping habits. There is much more to learn in accounting that we will not cover today that can help you more deeply analyze your financial situation and make informed decisions uh, to, and plan for your future. That intermediate accounting information can be found in several sources which will be listed at the end of this presentation. Okay, let's start by looking at monthly cash flow from operations, which is a very useful tool because it allows you to predict which months are likely to be low or even negative in terms of cash. I'm going to use the example of Nana Louie Farm in Bozeman, Montana, which is Tammy's farm. Last year, 2011, was the first year of operation for Nana Louie. Both Tammy and her partner worked full-time off-farm, which they will continue to do again this year. They started small last year with a five-member pilot CSA program and they sold produce at a couple of farmers markets. When they tallied up their total sales and expenses for the year, they found that they had broken even, which is exactly what they had planned to do for the first year. That first year was indeed a time for them to experiment with what crops and markets work well for them and to begin to build their farm's infrastructure, like the hoop house that you see above in the picture. This is a 2012 cash flow um, uh, from operations. It's a projection of cash flow from operations for 2012. In other words, it's Nana Louie's annual operating budget for the current year. As you can see, it's a monthly breakdown of what they expect to spend and to earn from going, growing and selling flowers, vegetables, and poultry. Some of the expense categories listed here are taken from the Schedule F tax form, which is used to report any profit or loss from farming to the IRS. A uh, few small adaptions were made to these uh, to the Schedule F categories to better suit Nana Louie's operations. So, for instance, look at um, the supplies line, um, and you can see that greenhouse was added to describe the kinds of supplies that they bought. And um, then in other expenses, there are several other expense categories that were simply condensed into that line um, for space issues on this slide. But you can look at the, uh, the full 2012 cash flow from operations statement um, 
from Nana Louie Farm for, for 2012 um, on the Atcher web webpage with the link to this webinar. So Tammy created this projection for the 2012 season based on her cash flow from operations for the 2011 year. At the end of 2011, she sat down with all her expense and sales receipts from that year and entered them into the months in which they were incurred. This helped her establish a baseline for cash inflows and outflows for the 2012 season with adjustments made based on a few change, changes they plan to make for uh, this year of their operation. For example, this year Nana Louie will increase flower production as well as the number of CSA members and also the cost per share. And since they stocked up on greenhouse supplies last year, they expect to have fewer of these expenses this year. And these changes are reflected in this 2012 budget. The most valuable information um, in this sheet is the operating profit line at the bottom. So uh, note that in March, May, and October, Nana Louie expects to actually spend more money than it takes in. The question for these farmers to ask themselves is, where will the farm come up with the money to pay those bills in those months? Um, and that could be from the off-farm jobs that they have um, that uh, the household to, to cover some of those high expense months. Um, this, this cash flow from operations is just one part of a full statement of cash flows, which also includes cash flow from financing, such as bank loans and off-farm income, and cash flow from buying and selling capital assets like a tractor. Um, a complete cash flow statement could help Nana Louie Farm figure out how to cover their operating expenses in March, May, and October. It would also be required by a bank when, a, when applying for a loan. However, um, we're going to focus in this webinar on cash flow from operations. Uh, okay, let's talk about an income statement now. Earlier, Tammy talked about how much gross income you need to shoot for in order to achieve your desired net income. The income statement lays out your total sales or gross revenue for a year of operating your farm, along with all the expenses and then what's left over for net farm income from operations. It allows you to see if the farm operation is making money. Also, you will need this same information to fill out your Schedule F tax form mentioned earlier um, when you do your taxes. In this hypothetical example, you can see the net farm income from operations is $2,000 or 25% of the gross income of $8,000. Um, the income statement has all the same income and expense categories as the cash flow from operation statement, which we just looked at, uh, with the addition of depreciation expense and interest. Depreciation is a way to express the everyday wear and tear on equipment, and it spreads the cost of replacement over the useful life of the product. I'll explain how to calculate depreciation in a minute. Note that in this income statement, buildings and land are, are not listed as an expense in the income statement. The value of these capital investments in your farm are revealed in the balance sheet, which I'll discuss next, and not in the income statement. For the income statement, the relevant expenses related to land, buildings, and equipment are the interest on the loan you receive to purchase these items the cost of repairing them, and their depreciation. A final point about the income statement. You get to decide what to do with that $2,000 net income. And as Tammy noted earlier, some beginning farmers decide to invest this money back into the farm right away, um, rather than take it out as owner's draw or household income. Um, and beginning farmers may also choose to put it into a savings account, um, over several years as they prepare for a larger cap capital investment like buying land. And, and Tammy mentioned an example um, of that in her discussion of Loon Organics Farm. 
Um, however, you may also need this cash as a cushion for the months when you expect your expenses to exceed your income as, as shown in your monthly projection of cash flows. Okay, so how to create an income statement. Well, since you need the same information to fill out your Schedule F tax form, go ahead and create your income statement when you do your taxes, preferably in January. The first thing to do is to grab a template income statement form, like one that's included on the ATRA page uh, with the link to this webinar. Next, fill in this template with the sales and expense categories you used for your cash flow from operations, which as you recall is based on the Schedule F categories. In the far right column of your cash flow from operations statement, enter the total for each spend expense and sales account as seen above. Now simply transfer the total amount by account into the income statement. Then add lines for depreciation and interest expense. Okay, like I said, depreciation is a way to express the everyday wear and tear on equipment. And it spreads the cost of replacing the equipment over the useful life of the product. So to calculate the depreciation, simply subtract the residual value, which is in this example $1,000, from the original cost of the project, of the product, uh, in this example $10,000, and divide it by the number of years you expect to use the equipment, so 15 years in this example. And what I mean by residual value is the amount you expect to be able to sell the used equipment or scrap metal uh, for when you no longer need it. So in other words, the annual depreciation for this piece of equipment would be $600. On to the balance sheet. Balance sheet is a summary of the total financial worth of the farm or assets. This includes your own investment or equity and what you owe, liabilities. It shows how much money you could keep if the farm were sold. Whereas the income statement covers a period of time like a month or a year, a balance sheet is the snapshot of your financial position on just one day. It can be any day, uh, but it's often created at the end of the year. A balance sheet does exactly as it sounds. It displays a balanced equation in which assets on the left side equals liabilities plus equity, shown on the right side. If we reflect on this for a minute, you see that the assets include all the items on your farm that you have bought. Chances are, though, you borrowed money to buy them. So liabilities are what your lenders can lay claim to, while equity is everything you've already paid off. That's why in this hypothetical, if this hypothetical farm were sold today for $62,000, the farmer could expect to pay $48,000 of that back to her creditors and keep $14,000 in her pocket. As you can see here, assets and liabilities are broken apart into current, intermediate, and long term. Current assets include cash and other liquid assets, while current liabilities are those debts which are payable within a year such as uh, an operating loan balance or a line of credit, credit um, or also um, for a longer term loan like for land or equipment, it would be the principal from that loan that's due this year. That would be a current liability as well. Intermediate assets include vehicles and equipment while intermediate liabilities are the debts usually from those equipment. So debts payable within um, in less, usually less than 10 years. Finally, long-term assets include land and buildings and the long-term liabilities are the debts on those assets, usually payable in 10 years or more. Equity then is the amount of wealth you've built, your investment in the farm, and like I said, how much you could keep if the farm were sold today. So what can a balance sheet tell you? Some key information the balance sheet shows is solvency, liquidity, and your financial progress over time. The latter is shown by comparing your equity or net worth from one year to the next. If you compare two, two or more ba annual balance sheets, and you should always create them at the same time of year, 
Uh, hopefully you will see your equity increasing each year as you pay off your loans. Solvency refers to your ability to pay off all debts uh, if your farm were sold today. We talked about this in the previous slide. We hear a lot today about houses that are underwater since the mortgage crisis. In other words, their liabilities are greater than their assets and they have a negative net worth. This is the same idea as solvency. Liquidity is also extremely important. It will tell you if you have enough money coming in from your business over the next 12 months to pay all your bills that are due in that same time period. A common guideline is that you should have roughly twice as much current assets as current liabilities. Finally, a balance sheet will be required by your lender when you apply for a loan. Um, often your lender can help you assemble the balance sheet, but it's really to your benefit if you understand what it says. So to create a balance sheet, first download a, a blank balance sheet, a template. Um, we have one of these also on the ATRA website with the link to this webinar. But the date you create the balance sheet at the top of the page. This is important because the balance sheet is meant to capture your financial position at a particular moment in time. Next, assemble your data. For the asset side, you'll need a bank statement from your farm checking account. You'll also, or savings account, you'll also need um, an inventory of the supplies you have on hand. Um, uh, so seeds, uh, tools, livestock feed, etc., as well as the current market value of large, intermediate, and long uh, long-term assets such as farm buildings, vehicles, and land. For the liability side, you'll need statements showing your loan balances. In addition, you'll determine the amount of principal due this year. Subtract that amount from your long-term liabilities and, um, and put it into your current liabilities, like I mentioned earlier. For equity or net worth, subtract total liabilities from total assets. So why keep records? Um, well, you, as I mentioned before, you need um, this data to create financial statements. Um, but there are a few other important reasons, uh, like records are what is going to allow you to be able to establish your cost of production and, um, and and help you determine prices for your products. Um, it'll also help you develop benchmarks for labor productivity. Um, if you track your labor, keep records on labor hours. Um, and it'll help you create enter enterprise budgets, which will allow you to see the profitability of particular crops. Um, so we're going to talk today about tracking expenses, sales, and labor, but you can also track yield, fertility inputs, uh, weather events, pe pests, etc. The key to success in, in uh, record keeping is create systems that, record keeping systems that you will actually use uh, and use consistently. So tracking expenses. Um, there are two parts to record keeping, collecting the source data, receipts or bills, and entering it into a journal. These are very simple, easy things to do, but they require diligence. Think of ways you can capture receipts and keep them together so that you don't accidentally throw them away or have to go searching for them later. In this picture, you can see several envelopes labeled with different expense accounts, such as supplies, car and truck maintenance, and again, um, these are based on expenses listed in the Schedule F form. These envelopes are being used to store receipts. Um, if you buy stuff in town, one strategy to uh, keep track of the receipts from those purchases, uh, if they're farm purchases, is to keep an envelope or bin in the car to collect those receipts and then take them into the house periodically to put them into these folders. Before you store the receipt, be sure that the date the vendor and the item are noted on the receipt before you before you store it. Um, you will need this information along with the amount of the purchase when you enter into the journal. You can enter all this information at the end of the year, monthly, or even weekly when you sit down to pay bills. Tracking revenue. A convenient way to record your transaction, transactions is to use duplicate invoices. 
uh, and to drop off one of those copies of the invoice with your delivery when you deliver to a wholesale buyer like a grocery store or a restaurant. For direct sale venues like a farmer's market where you don't use receipts, simply enter the total for the day directly into the sales log. And you can download a blank sales log from the Atra web webpage with this webinar. Um, so for basic level farm accounting, which is the focus of this webinar, we really encourage you to simply get started in record keeping and record your total sales by venue, um, farmers market, CSA, etc. Okay, tracking labor. Why should you track labor? Well, this will give you an idea of how long various tasks take you know, such as planting a 300-foot bed of tomatoes or harvesting 24 bunches of kale. Over time, you can begin to set guidelines for how long any particular task should take to complete. In the Organic Farmer's Business Handbook, author Richard Wiswell highly recommends keeping track of labor to better understand the cost of production per crop. He recommends that you keep a notebook or binder with a page for each crop um, arranged alphabetically. Um, keep that in your pack shed. Uh, at the top of each page, note the amount of land and the location of that crop. Create columns for the date, the task that you performed, and the amount of time it took. And also note whether that was uh, hand labor or by a tractor. So this means that you need to carry a pen and paper um, out to the field um, and a watch uh, while you're doing the field work, so you can take notes on this. Enter that info at the end of each day into the um, crop journal. Um, so, sorry, after a few years of farming, you'll probably be interested in knowing how lucrative any given crop is and what it's costing you to produce it. To do this, you need to keep records that are more detailed than we've presented to you today, which is um, which, as I said, we're just trying to get you started in record keeping. But to keep more detailed records, for instance, in addition to recording the total sales for a day at the farmer's market, you would also record the beginning and ending inventory of each crop you took to market. Doing this, keeping track of sales and expenses per crop, will allow you to create an enterprise budget, which reveals the cost of production and profit profitability for each crop. Um, and you can use this information to help you set prices and to compare the profitability of one crop to the next. Okay, and basically um, some of the other topics that I would encourage you to look into as you get more comfor comfortable with accounting principles are, like I said, enterprise budgets, um, also partial budgets which, which allow you to evaluate a proposed new method by examining positive and negative effects on cost and income against the old method. Um, and, and then profitabil profitability ratios um, where you can compare your farm to established benchmarks of financial well-being. Um, and so for instance, um, the current ratio allows you to um, get, a, get a real good feel for cash flow. Um, and we won't go into those, but um, these are things just to kind of keep on the horizon as you get more comfortable with accounting. So the final slide here, um, uh, and we'll leave this slide open for a while, um, but, but these are really great resources for, um, um, for looking into some of these more intermediate um, level accounting ideas and, and more in-depth analysis you can perform. So um, with that, I will turn it back to Rich. Okay, uh, thanks Hannah and Tammy. Uh, in the time we have left, let's get to some questions. These questions are representative of some of the issues that we're most frequently asked about concerning farm finances. And the first question uh, is going to go to Tammy. And it's, how do you estimate the cost of production? Thanks, Rich. Um, well, enterprises, enterprise budgets are a good place to start to find rough estimates of cost of production. And you can find enterprise budget templates on the ATRA website, although that um, 
Um, some of those are a little outdated. Uh, Jeff Shazinski's publication, Planning for Profit in Sustainable Farming, is another good place that has some templates. And um, that once you have a rough estimate um, of the, the expenses that are listed in an enterprise budget for specific types of production such as you know vegetable production, poultry farming and, and so on and so forth. You can call a local sort you can call local sources of suppliers that um, can give you local information because the prices are going to vary depending on where you're at throughout the, the country. So I always like to use one of those templates just to get an idea of the different um, expenses that will go into a specific type of crop and then um, and then from there calling local sources of where you can you know get those those supplies that are in that expense list just to get um, a, a real idea of how much it's going to cost you in your particular region. Okay good um, the next question will go to Hannah and it is uh, What's the best way to estimate sales before I start? Yeah, well, Tammy talked about this a little bit. Um, to estimate sales, um, you, sh you really need to figure out ahead of the growing season where you're going to sell your products um, and the price. Tammy, Tammy gave an example earlier of how um, Tumbling Shoals farm in North Carolina, um, those farmers went out to farmers markets and other venues, restaurants, etc., to find out um, what what some of the options were about what they could sell, um, look at the look at where the gaps were, look at what the prices were. Um, and you can so you can you can go to grocery stores that might be interested in buying local produce and talk to the produce manager, go to restaurants, talk to the chef, find out what they need that you could grow and how much they might be willing to buy. Um, and you know with the CSA it's pretty easy to estimate your sales once you know how many members you're going to have and your price per share. So put all of all of this information then into a table and on the, um, the top row you would have the market venues um, and then on in the first column to the left you would put the various crops so then um, you could so you'd start with carrots and for carrots you know that you're gonna sell such and such amount um, to a restaurant and you're gonna include such and such amount in your CSAs so you can put that volume and then your estimated sales amount per crop in that table um, and um, and and then f and so fill in all of those those um, those boxes and you'll get an idea of, of how much you're going to be able to sell and it'll be a really realistic estimate. Um, so again I'm going to refer to Richard Wiswell's organic farming hand um, organic farmers business handbook um, for this this marketing chart. You can look at a template in in his book um, on that. Okay, um, let's stick with uh, Hannah uh, for another question. It's in addition to setting a net income goal, uh, should I also include an hourly wage for myself and include that as a labor expense? Uh, you, yeah, you could certainly do this. I would re recommend it, uh, though maybe once you've been farming for a few years and are past the point of just breaking e breaking even. Um, in the early years of farming, your expenses will be high anyway, and you don't want to run into cash flows um, by taking money out to pay yourself an hourly wage. Um, you know, that said, labor labor is uh, really important to track, and so that's why we're encouraging you to to track the amount of labor. But um, earlier, Tammy mentioned. Um, um, uh, Terrell uh, Spence, and uh, who's an NCAT employee and and also has a pastured poultry operation, um, and and he he talks about thinking of um, of farming as getting a salary, and so in that sense, you you know if you focus on your net income, you know your target amount of household income, um, then that'll that'll be a guide for um, 
for your sales and you don't need to you don't need to think too much about um, being paid at an hourly rate. Uh, some people may have a different opinion about it, but this is just one way to approach it. Okay, um, Tammy, how much cash should I have on hand when I start to cover when I start to cover both expenses and the incidentals that come up? Yeah, and again, that goes back to your um, estimating your cost of production. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, Tumbling Shoals and Loon Organics both had sizable savings. I think that was one of the things that contributed to their success. So if you're not in a huge hurry to farm, um, you know, get experience and put a lot of money into savings. Um, but you first have to have an idea of what your costs are going to be going into it. If you're going to buy land, I think you typically have to have about 10% down anymore. I think the, the days of um, no, little to no down on buying a piece of property are gone. Um, and so you have to account for that. Um, but if you're just going to rent to start your farm and um, keep costs down that way, you can refer to um, the enterprise budgets that I referred to and plug those into a cash flow document and that will give you at least an idea of what your initial expenses are. Um, I think it's safe to assume though that about $10,000 is a good start for a farm that's just bootstrapping and not buying a big, you know, making huge equipment purchases, but just, you know, getting the bare bones of, of starting out. So, um, but again, you, you do need an enterprise budget and um, a cash flow document to kind of get those, those um, expenses down um, based on your region and your enterprise. Okay, well, um, I think that's all the time we have today. So thanks to Tammy and to Hannah, and thanks to all of you for viewing Farm Finances, Organizing and Understanding Your Numbers. Um, if you have more questions for, for Hannah and Tammy, you can contact them through the uh, ATRA contact information, which is up on your screen right now. And also, don't forget to check out the other webinars and all the information available at www.atra.incat.org. And thanks again for viewing our webinar today.